Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to all attending our Mastering Stress Avoiding Burnout session today. My name is Christine Kritzas. I'm a counseling psychologist from Lighthouse Arabia, and I'm looking forward to spending the next hour speaking about such a pertinent topic and something that I often see in my work with adults. Um, and today I'm going to be um, unpacking, you know, what stress looks like, you know, what are the causes of stress, and then we're going to look at some evidence-based tools that you can start implementing today as a means of mastering stress. If you give me a moment, I'm just going to share my deck with you. And just so that all of you know, the session will be recorded and we will be sharing the recording with you post session. If you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to pop them in the Q&A section and I will tend to them at the end of our session. I'm going to be speaking for about 40 to 45 minutes and then we'll allow 10 to 15 minutes for some questions. So please feel free to pop your, your questions in the chat. I see we have many people joining in now and I'm going to share my screen with you. So I am well acquainted with the topic of stress for two reasons. And I am well acquainted with the topic of burnout for two reasons. And the, the reason I say this is because over the past 13 years that I've been working in private practice, I would say majority of adults who have sought out therapy have come in and the presenting problem has been, I'm feeling stressed or I'm feeling overwhelmed. And I'm also well acquainted with the topic of burnout because I myself have experienced burnout twice in my career. So when I am sharing evidence-based tips and strategies with you, I want you to know that they are anchored in professional um, practice as well as in personal practice, okay? So I just want to see a show of hands. Can everybody see and hear me clearly? Just a show of virtual hands. Great, okay, my screen just lit up. Wonderful. So just a little bit about Lighthouse Arabia. We're a mental health and wellbeing center located in central Dubai, where we offer psychological services and psychiatric care to individuals across the lifespan. We have an occupational therapist and a speech and language therapist as well. And since the onset of the pandemic, we have taken majority of our services online. We have individual counseling online. We have support sessions that we run on a weekly basis. And if you're interested in learning more, please feel free to check out our website um, at lighthousearabia.com. So without any further delay, I want to get on to the topic of stress. I want us to understand why we're talking about this. What are some of the signs and symptoms that I may be struggling with stress or burnout? What are the sources of stress? And then how do we go about mastering our stress? So what we know, according to the World Health Organization, stress has been classified as the health epidemic of the 21st century. And we also know that according to Bruce Lipton, who's an who is an American developmental biologist, that over 90% of disease and illness today is not caused by our genes. It is caused by our lifestyle and the stresses in our lives. We have the capacity, according to epigenetics, to be able to turn on and turn off certain genes for cancer, for diabetes, just based off of our lifestyle. We don't have to have a family history of cancer to develop cancer. On the contrast, we might have a family history of diabetes and never go on to develop diabetes because we live and lead a healthy lifestyle and we don't allow stress to impact us in the ways that it can. Right. So before we look into 
what stress is and what it's not, I thought I would do a short quiz with you just to make sure that we're all awake. Um, we're heading into the afternoon and we want to make sure that we're all on, on board. Yeah. So true or false, you can pop your answers in the chat. Some stress is good for me. True or false? Now oh, I can see the question. I can see the answers are coming through nicely. And the answer is true. Some stress is good for me. And what we know is that there's a very fine line between stress going from good to bad. What we know is that stimulation is good for us. Roger Federer, who's won countless Grand Slams, wouldn't be on the top of his game, no pun intended, if he did not have a little bit amount of stress to, to get him to perform at his peak. And so what we know is that stimulation is really good for us. And we just need to keep checking it to make sure that it is in the zone of stimulation, that it doesn't move into the red zone. But some stress is good for us. If we just know how to manage it, Kelly McGonigal, who is a psychologist um, from Stanford University, speaks about how stress is something that can be stimulating. Stress is something that can get us to perform at our best. Um, just the right amount of stress is needed to be able to get us to be more organized in our work, to fulfill our duties in, in the workplace, to meet certain deadlines. So we do need it and it is good for us, but it is how we are managing it that matters most. Okay, and Professor Robert Sapolsky from Stanford University also speaks about the topic of stress. And he says that if you go on a roller coaster, um, you're going to feel very stimulated. You're going to feel um, a little bit of stress about the fact that you're on this roller coaster, right? But it's enjoyable. But now imagine you're on that roller coaster every single day. And every single day you're feeling oh, these tense emotions and feeling overwhelmed and a bit scared right? So it depends on the amount. It depends on the severity, the frequency, and the duration, which then tells us whether or not it's moving into the red zone. Stress comes from events and circumstances, true or false? The answer is false. And the reason it is false is because stress does not come from events and circumstances. Stress comes from our interpretation of those events and circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so there is a parable. Um, there's a story about Buddha and a student. And Buddha goes to a student and he says to the student, if I strike you in the arm with this arrow, will it be painful? Mm -hmm. And the student says, mm, yes, I think so. And Buddha says, correct. And then Buddha goes back a, a few hours later and says, if I were to strike you in the same arm with the same arrow, would that be more painful? And the student says, yes, I think so. And Buddha says, correct. And basically, the moral of the story is that the first arrow is the event or the circumstance that happens in our life. The second arrow is our interpretation of that event or circumstance. Pain is inevitable. We will all experience pain at some point in our life, but suffering is optional. And that second arrow is the suffering. That second arrow is your interpretation of the first strike. Okay, so always remember that it's not the event or the circumstance, it's how you're interpreting that event or circumstance. It's a story that you're telling yourself about that event or circumstance that leads you to feeling more stressed. Stress is the same for everyone, true or false? I'm loving this active participation. And the answer is false. What we know is that we all have different starting points. What we know is that pre-COVID, different people had different experiences. And when COVID-19 struck, there may have been individuals who have experienced healthcare issues. 
that have experienced a trauma with a previous flu that they had um, they had contracted, um, that the, the, there may have been certain events in their life that triggered them more at the time when they learned about the pandemic. And so what we need to understand is that we all have different starting points here. We don't all see things the same way. And, and we might be observing the same thing unfolding and have completely different reactions to it based off of our own history, our own um, internal beliefs about certain things that unfold. And so we really need to meet each other with compassion during a time like this and understand that we all going at this at the best that we can and trying to do things at the best that we can. So very important to remember that it's not the same for all of us. I cannot perform my best unless I'm stressed. True or false? And the answer is false. So you might think that I perform well under pressure. And I hear this often with um, consultants that I work with and individuals in professional services. They say to me, no, I perform best under pressure. That's the, that's the best time for me to do what I need to do. And I challenge that. I challenge that a lot because I will then say to them, but did you enjoy doing it last minute? Did you, did you experience excitement doing it last minute or did you experience some level of stress doing it last minute because what we know is that perfectionism is what breeds procrastination if we are perfectionistic in our tendencies we will leave things until the last minute because it might not be the way it's supposed to be so what we need to understand is that leaving things to the last minute is going to activate that fight or flight stress response and when our fight or flight stress response is activated, it can lead to us experiencing a lot of physical Ill illnesses, right? So I'm going, to, I'm going to share the link with you soon on that. The best way to deal with stress is exercise, breathe and relax. True or false? Right. The answer is false. And you're probably thinking, what? That can't be the case. Just hear me out. Exercise, breathing, and relaxation are definitely tools that we need in our toolbox to deal with stress. But it is not the number one thing that we are going to be using to deal with stress. It is one of many things but we need to understand that you can do all the yoga there is to do, and you can drink all the kale juice around, and you can exercise all that you want. But if your mindset is one that always looks to the negative, is one that always looks for the problem over the solution, is one that is a scarcity mindset rather than an abundance mindset, is one that is a fixed mindset rather than a growth mindset, you will always find yourself struggling to deal with stress because it is how you're thinking about this that is creating more and more of the stress. So it is a combination of having a growth mindset first, which is going to help deal with that stress, and then exercise, breathing, relaxation, yoga are going to be very important tips and tools to implement to deal with stress. But remember that it's understanding mindset first and fixing mindset first, and then all the other things come into place. Okay. So what's the difference between stress and burnout then? Because we use these interchangeably. And I think we need to understand that stress is something that is short term. And we might experience some stress about the fact that we have a presentation due in um, a week, a week's time, or we have a deadline in three days time. And we may feel a lot of stress in that moment. We may feel overly engaged with that task and trying to get it done. Um, but we are still very engaged in our work during that time. And when that deadline passes, the stress will drop. Okay, and we will go back to our normal state of being. 
Um, but if the if the stress is not dealt with, it can lead to anxiety and it can be physically physically tolling on the body. Burnout, on the other hand, is more long term. It is prolonged stress over a period of time. So I'm feeling this stressed feeling more days than not over weeks on end. And the way that we can experience burnout is when we feel disengaged with our work. We don't feel that we enjoy our work anymore. We don't feel that we get meaning out of our work anymore. We feel that we're just clocking in and clocking out, but it's not really feeding our soul. It doesn't make us come alive. Um, and often we can experience burnout when, um, when we realize that uh, what we're doing is not aligned with our core values um, or the firm that we work for, their values are not aligned with your core values or a supportive boss leaves the company and you start feeling like, oh, I don't really feel like I connect with anybody here anymore. So burnout is related to the workplace specifically, okay? And what we see is that when a person goes through a burnout, they lose interest in, in, in their work. They may have presenteeism, which means that they're showing up at work, but they're very absent at work. They don't really want to be there anymore. And this can be emotionally tolling. And the difference between burnout and depression, okay, because these are also quite um, similar in their presentation, is that with Depression, it is far more pervasive. Depression shows up in all areas of our life. Depression doesn't only show up in the workplace. Depression is something that we experience um, in the workplace, in our personal lives, in our social lives. So if it is that you go on holiday to the Maldives um, and you've been feeling very low at work, you haven't been enjoying your work, you've been disengaged with your work and you take a break and you go on holiday for two weeks, if it was burnout that you were experiencing, you will find that as soon as you leave the workplace and you go on holiday, you're going to start feeling a lot better and coming back to yourself. But if it was depression that you were experiencing, you will leave work and go on holiday to the Maldives, but you will still feel empty. You will still feel like you wake up with a low mood, that you're feeling indifferent about life. So depression, far more pervasive than burnout. Okay. Very important that we understand the fight or flight stress response because this is what is happening in our bodies at the time that we're feeling stressed. And the fight or flight stress response is our body's inbuilt defense mechanism. It has been around for as long as man has been around. It is um, what keeps us safe. And so, you know, back in the day, if you had a big brown bear charging you, your fight or flight stress response would be activated and you would then have two hormones being released into the system, adrenaline and cortisol. And then we would find that our breathing gets deeper, our, um, our heart rate speeds up. We find that blood leaves the smaller muscle groups and moves to the larger muscle groups so that we can take flight. Um, we also find that we need as much energy as possible during that time. So the body shuts down long-term projects such as the digestive system shuts down um, because we don't need to be thinking about digesting our food when we might become somebody else's food, i.e. the bear. We just know we need to run. Okay, so the digestive system shuts down, the growth hormone shuts down, um, ovaries in women shut down during a time where they're experiencing a lot of stress. And what we then see is that over time, if your fight or flight stress response is activated more days than not, you're going to start experiencing physical illnesses. You're going to start um, developing physical illnesses such as onset of diabetes to um, onset of cancer, heart disease, because it is physically tolling on the body. And Professor Robert Sapolsky from St Stanford University, who's done a lot of research on the topic of stress, says that human beings are the only species that are able to activate their fight or flight stress response through thought alone. So guess what? You could be on holiday in the Maldives and without a stressor in sight, there are no big brown bears around, um, and you just have a thought that, 
oh, I've got a presentation due in two weeks time at work and I didn't bring my laptop to the Maldives to work on that presentation. Am I going to have enough time to do it in three days when I return back to, um, to work? And then you activate the fight or flight stress response. So we are, we are capable of activating it just through thought alone. All right. So just remember that. And remember what is happening in the body in this time. What are some physical signs of stress? Frequent headaches, high blood pressure, back pain, sleep problems, stomach feeling quite upset. Okay, so these are some physical symptoms of, of stress. Some cognitive related symptoms are forgetfulness, difficulty concentrating, um, Presenteeism, as I mentioned earlier, it means you're showing up at work, but you're completely checked out. You're making very bad decisions and you don't care really about what's happening at work. Um, and there may be poor judgment. And then on the emotional front, what we oft often see with individuals who are experiencing stress is an irritable mood, just very irritable, very snappy. Um, and, you know, feeling a sense of loneliness or isolation when one is experiencing these stresses. So these are just some of the emotional effects and, and symptoms that one may be experiencing stress. On the behavioral front, we might see that this person is rushing around, um, experiencing crying spells, increased smoking. Okay, so just some, some things on the behavioral front to be on the lookout for. And then the sources of stress in the workplace, I think I would highlight, um, I would highlight number two, and I would highlight number five, and I would highlight number eight. And what I'll say about number two is that we often see that, especially in, in the time of a pandemic, when people are working from home, their work day bleeds into their leisure time. They're not having this clear cut from now I'm leaving work and now I'm going back home because they are at home throughout the time. And uh, we often see that, you know, um, employ employers aren't always respecting boundaries around um, sending messages late at night or emails late at night. So that's one thing to take into account, the lack of social support, being an expat, um, being away from your immediate support network can be a big stressor for people. Um, and then we also know bad management practice is something that um, can often be a huge stressor. The other day I was listening to a podcast about um, what is it that causes depression and anxiety? And one of the causes of depression and anxiety is the idea that, that employees feel micromanaged by their management. They feel that they are not trusted by their management. They feel that they have no sense of control over their workday. Um, it's a very much a hierarchical um, structure in the organization that we you know, have to clock in and clock out and we get checked all the time and micromanaged. That in itself can contribute to depression and anxiety in an individual and to burnout because what they have found is that self-management systems work way better when I know that my, my manager trusts me to get the work done, but doesn't breathe down my neck and say, have you done it? Have you done it? Have you done it? But just trust that I will do it. I feel like I can go with this. I feel like I'm empowered and I'm in control. And then some psychological sources of stress. Your mindset really matters, yeah. Um, Carol Dweck, who is also a professor from Stanford University, coined the term uh, growth mindset. And what she, what she found is that individuals who adopt a growth mindset, which is they believe that they can develop and um, uh, develop certain skills just through practice. So I might not know how to code on the computer, but if I um, take a course, then I can learn coding. Um, I might not be able to ride a bicycle yet, so putting the word yet at the end of the sentence can help with um, growing that growth mindset. People with a fixed mindset are, who are very rigid in their ways um, tend to 
uh, be more vulnerable to experiencing anxiety and depression because they believe that their abilities are, are carved in stone. And if I can't ride a bicycle, I'll never know how to ride a bicycle. If I can't run a 10 kilometer race, I'll never know how to run a 10 kilometer race. And so you can often pick up on, on the individuals who have more of a fixed mindset. They'll be the ones to say, no, I'm not a morning person. No, I'm, I'm not a runner. No, I'm not, um, uh, I'm not autistic at all. Um, I can't draw at all. But have you tried? Have you tried? And have you thought about if I took a course, I might learn how to do something. So it's the growth mindset that matters. Addiction to stress, um, Dr. Joe Dispenza, who is a chiropractor and has done a lot of research in the field of epigenetics, speaks about how we can be addicted to gambling. We can be addicted to smartphones, to gaming, to tech, to pornography, to shopping, to sugar. But the fiercest addiction of them all is our addiction to stress. And what he has found is that um, as human beings, we get addicted to feeling certain feelings. And so if it is that you wake up one morning and you don't feel stressed, you just feel very calm, your mind might go, why am I feeling so calm? And then it will find something to stress about. So then it thinks to itself, or oh, maybe I should take on that project at work. Or you get individuals who are addicted to drama. And I'm sure all of you know one of those individuals in your life that's addicted to drama. And they wake up in the morning and they think, I haven't had a fight with anyone today. Um, I think I'm going to, maybe I should uh, call my mom-in-law. Maybe I should call my, my spouse and, you know, create some sort of drama because a day without drama just doesn't seem right. So they look for opportunities to create that drama so that they can then have that feeling again because they're addicted to that feeling. So be aware that we're addicted to certain emotions. And so if it is that you're feeling a bit anxious one day, you might start looking for a reason to match that feeling. So being aware of that and also knowing that individuals who are obese, who are smokers, who um, lead very unhealthy lifestyles, who have very high blood pressure, um, are at lower risk of developing heart disease than someone who has type A personality. What they found in the research was that someone with type A personality is at higher risk for developing heart disease than someone who, who smokes and is obese. So type A personality are those individuals who are go-getters. Um, they can be quite aggressive, sometimes quite controlling, um, high achievers, but they experience joyless ambition. You know, they achieve something great, but they don't feel the joy of it because they could have done better. And, you know, they're always thinking about the next thing that they need to achieve and go after and grow in. Um, and so people with type A personality can be at higher risk. Um, perfectionists can be at higher risk. Um, a lack of self-awareness or control over my environment can be a stressor and not having the skills. And the most important skill to have is time management because you cannot develop other skills if you can't manage your time enough to be able to, met, to, to develop those skills. Right. So just some sources of stress. We know that, you know, if we are not getting seven to eight hours of sleep a night, that can really impact on our stress levels. Who over here gets less than six hours of sleep a night? Wow. Okay, my screen just lit up. And what we know is that less than seven hours of sleep is considered sleep deprivation. Okay. Um, and on the relational front, you know, if it is that we are um, in a relationship with someone where, we, where there's a lot of toxicity, this can really um, increase our stress levels. What we also know is that a loneliness can shave up to four years off a person's life. So also just knowing that there may be daily hassles that are happening, you know, I have to go and get the vaccination and then I go to the, to the clinic to see if I can get the vaccination and then they tell me that 
um, you know, I have to book an appointment and things keep changing. And so that can create some stress, major life events, moving home, moving country, loss of a loved one, loss of a job, divorce, separation. Um, these are all stresses. Techno brain. What we know is that technology has evolved a lot quicker than people's etiquette around technology. And countries like Japan and France have, um, have, have implemented the right to disconnect legislation, which means that when their employees leave work at 6 p.m., they may not be contacted by um, their managers. They have every right to disconnect from email, from WhatsApp, and then reconnect the following morning at 9 a.m. And so this can really go a long way when we have some boundaries in place around technology usage. Right, so how are we managing stress when we don't have a robust toolbox? We may resort to suppressing our emotions. We may resort to numbing behaviors such as overeating, undereating, zoning out in front of the TV for hours, um, smoking, procrastinating, um, you know, withdrawing from friends, family, or self-medicating. So these are some unhelpful ways of managing our stress. So now that we know the unhelpful ways, now I'm going to spend some time going through the, the effective ways for mastering stress. And what I will say is that being able to manage your time effectively can go a very long way. Um, and if you say yes to one thing, always remember you saying no to another thing. If you say yes to taking on another project at work, it means you saying no to having dinner with your family in the evenings. If you say yes to watching that last episode of Suits on Netflix at 11 p.m. at night, it means you saying no to waking up at 6 a.m. in the morning. Okay, so always remember there's something that's got to give and always allow time for travel, allow time for, um, you know, possibly getting stuck in traffic. So, and prioritizing what is most important, what is most urgent versus what is important but not urgent, right? So having a look at that and outsourcing time consuming tasks. And I would also suggest that you get into a habit of time boxing and time boxing looks a bit like this, that you actually put your to do list into your Google calendar and that you put down the days that you're going to go to gym, you put down um, the hours that you're going to be doing work, you put down the time that you're going to be doing nothing. Um, and the gold lines are lines to stop and breathe and maybe do a one minute meditation. But if you don't block it out, it doesn't happen. Failing, so planning, so failing to plan means planning to fail, right? So just remember that. Remember to block out that time and focusing on what you can control, okay? Because what we see is that we are often concerned with how others are, you know, following the social distancing rules and why aren't they wearing their masks and why are they having gatherings with more than 10 people and um, don't focus on them because you're going to find yourself feeling more helpless, more hopeless, more anxious. Focus on what is within your control. Don't focus on things that are outside of your control. And so what are the things that are within your control? Your thoughts, your feelings, your actions. Keep that in mind. And the first thing that I would suggest that is in your control is your physical health. Take a bottom-up approach here. Focus on your physical health first. If I can prescribe anything to you today around mastering your stress, I would say make sure you're getting seven to eight hours of sleep a night and then look to exercise at least three times a week because you need to get your body moving because emotion is energy in motion. If you are moving your body, you're releasing tension, okay? So seven to eight hours of sleep a night and exercise, right? So these would be the two things I would suggest. And think about the story that you're telling yourself because we often come up with stories around things that happen in our life. And there are multiple perceptions of one reality. So it's important that you preface your story with the story that I'm telling myself right now 
is that I'm not as distinctive as my colleagues and I'll never get that promotion. And that's just the story. Because if you can separate yourself from it, then you can see that it's just a story that you're telling yourself. And you could be telling yourself another story that might be more helpful. So the story that I'm telling myself right now is that you prefer spending time with your friends rather than with me. The story that I'm telling myself right now is that I can't wake up at 5 a.m. because I'm not a morning person. And this is what keeps people stuck in their comfort zone. Because if I keep saying I'm not a morning person, well, then that means that I never have to get up at 5 a.m. in the morning because I'm not a morning person. And I often say to my clients who say that, I often say to them, that's genius of you. That's genius that you keep saying I'm not a morning person because then it keeps you you know, in, in that comfort zone and you justify all the time that you never get up early to go to train. So if you change that narrative, you will start seeing that you'll start stepping out of your comfort zone. Stop saying, I'm not a morning person. Start saying, I'm an early riser. Start saying, I have energy in the mornings. So stop labeling yourself because that restricts who you are and what you are. Stop saying, I'm not a runner. Stop saying, I'm not artistic or I'm not creative. Stop it because then you limit who you can be in this life. And so if you, you look into that and start changing and challenging these thinking traps, it can go a long way. And choose your words carefully. Pastor Joel Osteen, who does mass sermons in the States, was on the Oprah Winfrey show many years ago. And he says that whatever follows I am is going to come looking for you. If you say I am tired, more fatigue will come looking for you. If you say I am unlucky, more scenarios in life where you will experience feeling unlucky will come looking for you. If you keep saying I am fat, more calories will come looking for you. So remember that when you say I am, you're emitting something out into the universe because I am is the same frequency as OM, which is the frequency of the universe. So pay attention to what you are saying after the words I am. And I want you to try something here with me now. I want you all to say out loud, I have to go to gym. And now I want you all to say out loud, I get to go to gym. When we say I have to go to gym, we are operating from a victim stance, like something's happening to me, I have to go to gym. But when we say I get to go to gym, we operate from a stance of empowerment, a stance of gratitude, that I get to go to gym, right? Instead of saying I am exhausted, try saying I had a productive day. Instead of saying I have to go to the opera tonight, Try saying, I'm choosing to go to the opera tonight. I'm choosing to go to gym this morning. I'm choosing to go to work today. All right, because when it's our choice, we feel more empowered. Instead of saying, I can't do public speaking, put the word yet at the end of the sentence. I can't do public speaking yet. That opens up the gap for learning more about that, okay? Which is a great tool and technique for kids as well when it comes to teaching them how to attempt at things and try things, okay? If you change your language, you change your frequency. And how do we manage physical and contextual stress? Engage in a reflective practice whereby you journal. In the evenings, writing down, you know, three things that I am grateful for or three things that happened in my day that really um, made me feel good and made me smile. So engaging in that reflective practice, writing down things that happen in your day, writing down the things that trigger you or the things that concern you. And very important that we are breathing, moving, hydrating, eating, sleeping, relaxing and engaging in acts of kindness at work. So being generous with others. The greatest act of generosity is giving someone of your time. Make time for people. Make time to know what's going on in their world. And declutter your space because it really does impact on how you feel internally when your external environment is a cluttered space. Technology, make use of tech that is helping and not hurting. And I'll share some apps with you shortly. And then remember that 
um, one of the greatest mitigators against stress is having a supportive network of people. A problem shared is a problem halved. There's wisdom in that saying. If you share your concerns with five people, you, you're allowing them to carry the weight of that problem with you. And so it's also one of the strongest predictors of happiness. We know that deep, meaningful connections is what is needed to experience a happy life. And making effort for friends, even if they yeah, for a short while. We often hear people saying that, you know, oh, um, I'm not going to bother making friends because people just leave every two years. You know, so I would say make the effort because you never know where your paths will cross again. And use social media for connecting with people and not necessarily comparing yourself to others. And something that I'll share with you is adopting a morning routine. And I can share a personal story with you. About three years ago, I found myself in a bit of a rat race. I would wake up in the morning and I'd hit the ground running. And my morning routine was something like this. I would wake up, I would grab my phone, I would check emails, I would see, you know, there's a WhatsApp from my family group about friends of mine that got engaged. Then I would go onto Facebook and congratulate the couple. Then I'd go onto Instagram and see what's happening in the world of my friends. Then I would see that some page has a dress sale. By 7.30 a.m. in the morning, I bought a dress and been on three social media platforms. And I just felt like I didn't have time for myself. And it made sense because I was reacting to the world. I was waking up in a state of reaction. And when we do that, we release cortisol into the body very early in the morning. And then I came across a term known as own your mornings. Robin Sharma speaks about it in his book, The 5am Club. And what I learned is that um, it's important that we give time to ourselves. So my morning routine at the moment is as follows. And it's something that I've shared with clients and my clients have reported only positive feedback after having implemented the strategy. When I wake up in the morning, present day, I ditch my phone. And the first hour of my day is spent going inwards, right? Being proactive, thinking about my new day resolution. What is it that I need from myself today? And what's my intention gonna be for today? Because I don't believe in New Year's resolutions. They don't really last. And I don't think um, anyone on this call um, can tell me any different that, you know, if you stick to something that for 365 days, you'll do that something. No, that's very rigid. Okay. But I believe in new day resolutions, which is setting an intention for the day, which is to drink two to three liters of water. Um, so when I wake up in the mornings, I, I drink a cup of boiling water and lemon, I um, might engage in meditation, I might uh, go out for a walk, I might listen to my podcast. Um, so these are ways in which I can recharge in order to be there for others throughout the day. And I know there are parents on this call and you're thinking to yourself, you're right, Christine, how am I supposed to own my morning with a two-year-old in my bed at 6 a.m.? And I'm gonna say, start small, and I'm going to say, you still don't need to be on your phone for that hour, right? So it is about having boundaries with technology. Um, and even if it is that you wake up 10 minutes earlier than your two-year-old or 10 minutes earlier than the kids, that you allow that time just to reflect on the things that you're grateful for, um, the things that you want to achieve in your day, the values that you want to align with, thinking about what's the best version of myself um, that I can be today, okay? And then some anti-stress tech uh, that we, we like to use. Um, Omvana is a great app. The Stop, Breathe, Think uh, is a great app. Happify, the Singing Bowls app. Um, you can Google uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza's um, meditations. You can Google seven chakra meditation music. So there are a lot of different um, resources online that you can look into using. And if you found the content of this uh, session helpful, you can 
follow us on um, Instagram. We have two accounts for our adults at Lighthouse Arabia and at Dr. Salia Fridi, where we're sharing pertinent, relevant information around adult mental health and well-being, helping you along your journey to self-discovery. And then we have two accounts for our parents out there. We have at Lighthearted Parenting, which is an account where we share authentic, um, you know, tips around real parenting and um, helping you along your journey as a parent. Then we have the at Smart Heart Board Game account. I'm the creator of the Smart Heart Board Game, which aims at facilitating emotional intelligence in kids. And today we actually launched version 2.0 of our game. And um, on, this, on this platform, we share tips and tools with parents around cultivating EQ in your kids, as well as in yourselves, because we are still learning and growing ourselves. And then we have the at Lighthouse Insight account, which is for our teenagers. And then we also have a TikTok account at Lighthouse Arabia. So please feel free to follow us on these platforms. And now I'm going to leave some time for some questions. Right. I'm just going to have a look here what questions come up. If you just give me a moment. Normally I pass out at my desk when I'm stressed. It randomly happens. How can I remedy that? I would look at the frequency that that is happening. I would first get a checkup with the general practitioner. So go to the doctor, go and have your blood checked um, and see if there's an underlying biological reason for that first before you put, put it down to stress. Um, but if it is that there are no biological signs, then I would look to consult with a mental health care professional to develop some tips and tools and strategies around that. How do we deal with that thought when we are trying to relax, knowing we have deadlines approaching. I would suggest that you start becoming aware of your thoughts and you be a gentle observer of your thoughts rather than, um, rather than trying to push the thought away. Because if I say to you, don't think about a pink elephant, what are you going to do? You just thought about a pink elephant. So it's no point in saying to you, don't think about that deadline. You're going to think about the deadline, but you can be a gentle observer of the deadline. You could be a gentle observer that I'm having that thought again about the deadline. And it's okay. I have many thoughts in a day, and this is just one of them. Um, don't feed it. Just observe it, notice it, and move on. Okay. And if it continues to loop in your head, write it down on a piece of paper journal about it okay what we feed will grow if you resist something it will persist so what we resist persists we don't want to resist it we don't want to push it away we just want to be aware of it okay right some people say that they can sleep four hours of a night and feel just as refreshed what is your take on that i don't believe it I don't believe it. And there's research that backs this. If you're interested in learning more, you can read um, uh, Matthew Walker's book on why we sleep. And in there, he speaks about what is happening in the body when you're only getting those four hours of sleep versus those eight hours of sleep. We have a glymphatic system which drains out toxins from the brain, which is only activated in deep sleep. And we need to go through several deep sleep cycles in the night. And in order to go through several deep sleep cycles in the night, you need to be sleeping seven to eight hours. You are not going to go through those several deep sleep cycles only on four hours of sleep, which then tells me that the brain is not clearing out those toxins. And they have found a strong correlation between the development of Alzheimer's disease and the lack of sleep. Okay. Very strong connection, very strong connection between lack of sleep and low mood and anxiety, very strong connection between lack of sleep and inability to focus. 
properly, inability to regulate our emotions. When we don't get a good night's sleep, we are 60% more reactive the next morning. Our amygdalas, which are the tiny almond-like structures in the brain, are 60% more reactive if you do not get a good night's sleep. And that is why our kids are throwing tantrums often when they're not getting a good night's sleep. And as, as adults, we're also throwing tantrums because we're not getting a good night's sleep. So I disagree with that idea that you only need four hours of sleep a night. How can I manage to sleep seven to eight hours? I'm used to sleeping six hours or less, and I always wake up um, before the alarm clock. So I would treat your sleep the way you would treat a newborn baby sleep. Make sure that there's a routine in place for yourself. Make sure that you're in comfortable pajamas. Make sure that you have your chamomile tea next to your bed at night. Make sure that you have lavender pillow spray that you can spray on your pillow before bedtime, that the lights are dim, that um, you are not drinking caffeine after 12 p.m. that day, okay? Because caffeine stays in the system for up to 12 hours. So make sure that you're having your last cup of coffee early in the day and that you're not drinking too much coffee during the day. Um, make sure that uh, you are not on your tech just before bedtime because the blue light that emanates from your smartphone is the same light that surgeons use in theater when they're operating on a patient at 2 a.m. in the morning to alert the surgeon to operate on the right leg and not the left leg, do not fall asleep. And so the blue light that they are using is the same light that comes out of your phone, is the same light that delays the release of melatonin, the sleep hormone needed for us to go into those deep sleep cycles. So make sure that you have OcuShield, any blue light blocking um, glasses that you can wear in the evenings just to make sure that you are combating that, right? You will not be receiving this PowerPoint. You'll be receiving a recording of the session. Is the fear of getting a disease a type of anxiety? Yes, it is. So that constant rumination, those obsessive thoughts that we have about the fact that we might get ill, um, uh, is there is an underlying anxiety there. Is it true that some people have more energy post afternoon than early morning, leading them to think they are not a morning person? So yes, some people can get, get, can get into a rhythm of um, being a night owl. Again, a label that we put on ourselves that now I'm a, I'm a night owl and I don't have energy in the mornings. But what what Daniel Pink suggests, who's the author of the book When, is that human beings have got a, um, a, an, an inbuilt uh, cycle that we follow. And if you are like two thirds of the population who fall asleep at 11 p.m. and wake up at 7 a.m., then your energy levels are gonna look as follows. The first two hours after waking up, um, so from seven to nine, um, you have got a lot of energy and what they found is that you should start creating um, two hours after waking up so from 9 a.m till 12 you should use that as your creative analytical time um, and then the afternoon comes you might experience a dip in energy and then in the late afternoon you experience um, a rise in energy again um, so important that you understand what is happening in the body and if it is that you are exercising late at night, you're going to find it hard to fall asleep because exercise gives you energy, which then makes you that night owl. So I would then switch up your day and start exercising first thing in the morning so that when the evening comes, you can get into that night routine a lot quicker. Okay. Um. How can we manage stress generated by annoying managers? So I would uh, suggest adopting the technique of observe, don't absorb. There's a technique, you can Google it, observe, don't absorb. And it is about 
learning how to observe your manager as opposed to absorbing what your manager is saying. Imagine that it's a film that is playing out in front of you and rather just watch the film than feed the film. And being able to turn the volume down when someone is saying unhelpful things or is um, being mean um, is very important. And when you are in a meeting with a very difficult manager, you might want to imagine that you have a gold shield around your body and you know that his words or her words are just um, bouncing off of that shield. So observe what they are doing, don't absorb what they are doing, set mental boundaries with these individuals. And you know, to yourself, you can say, that's your truth. And if they say something that you don't agree with, you can say, that's interesting that you would say that, oh, I'm sorry that you think that, meaning that I'm not gonna take that on board. That's not my truth, that's your truth. So, you know, Google observe, don't absorb technique. It's a great technique. Um, what can I do instantly to overcome a panic situation? So the thing you need to know about a panic attack is that um, it can come out of nowhere and that a panic attack will always ride its course. And a panic attack can last from 10 minutes up to an hour. And it's just important that during that time, you engage in positive self-talk and you say to yourself, you name it to tame it. You say to yourself, I'm experiencing panic right now. It's not dangerous. I won't die from it. And with time, it will pass. Just understanding that and using four, seven, eight breathing. So breathing in through your nose for four seconds, holding for seven seconds and releasing for eight seconds is going to help with activating the parasympathetic nervous system, which is your rest and digest system, right? So that's a great way to deactivate the fight or flight system. Right. I'm just having a look. There are many questions coming through. I cannot find your Instagram. Um, our Instagram is at Lighthouse Arabia, at Smart Heart Board Game, at Lighthearted Parenting. So these are all on Instagram. Um, if you have a look at Lighthouse Arabia, you'll find all the other accounts. Right, let's see. So I'm seeing a lot of questions here about getting a good night's sleep and any tips around getting a good night's sleep. And I would say that, you know, it's important that you understand that there are a combination of factors that lead to good sleep. Exercising first thing in the morning is going to help with you getting to sleep at night. Don't exercise at 7 p.m. at night if it is that you want to be in bed and asleep by 10 p.m. because it gives you energy. So you need to switch that around. You need to look at you know, the types of foods you're eating, making sure you're not going to bed on a, on a heavy stomach because your body then needs to digest food at that time. So you know, you're not gonna get the proper sleep that you need um, and making sure that your diet is um, sleep friendly as well, making sure that you're sleeping in a cold room, but a very warm bed, sleep in your pajamas, Ariana Huffington, who um, heads up um, Thrive and who, who used to head up, head up um, Huffington Post, did a talk for the World Economic Forum many years back. And she spoke to business leaders about the importance of wearing your pajamas to bed because there's something known as in clothes cognition. And, you know, if you dress the part, you're going to feel the part. So if you go to bed wearing your exercise clothes, you're signaling to the brain that I'm going to go and work out. You're not signaling to the brain that I'm going to go and rest. So put pajamas on in the evening, get into bed um, with your pajamas on and um, get into a routine where you're reading a book in the evenings and not necessarily going online and spending time on Instagram and Facebook because that stimulates you again. So you need to calm the system down, right? So be very aware of what you are, are taking in. Right.
I have kids. I have two kids and there's never enough time. I find it hard to get time to exercise. Also, my partner is not supportive, so it gets very difficult to manage. Yes, I can understand that that can create a lot of stress. Um, but I'm going to say start small. I'm going to say watch your relationship with your phone. You'll be amazed at how much more time you have when you ditch your phone. How much more time you have for yourself when you put the phone away. And finding small moments in the day to connect with yourself. Right. I've seen a question come up here. How is stress measured? So you need to pay attention to the physical symptoms that you're experiencing. So you might experience heart palpitations, you might experience chest pain, you might experience uh, muscle tension, you might experience constipation, you might experience um, uh, headaches, tummy aches. It may manifest itself um, in, the, in the mental body. So you might um, have uh, obsessive thoughts going through, through, going through your mind. You might find it hard to concentrate. You might find it difficult to be in the company of friends and loved ones. So it can be measured in many different ways. It's the impact that the symptoms are having on your day-to-day -day functioning. If you are struggling to connect with your friends, if you're struggling to do your work, if you're struggling to fall asleep at night, if you're struggling to eat, pay attention to that, okay? And don't go at it alone. If you are having concerns about your health, don't leave it. Consult with a mental health care professional. Get the help that you need. I'm a firm believer in um, therapy. I'm in my own therapy process. I have my therapist. He's based in San Francisco. I meet with him once every two weeks. And I find it is so helpful to have somebody um, to be an attuned, compassionate witness to the things that you're experiencing. Because we all, we're all growing. And we continue to grow and evolve. And if you want to learn more about yourself and discover parts of yourself and um, live an authentic life, I would suggest getting into your own therapy process. It's the greatest investment you'll ever make. Right. So this brings us to the end of our session today. Um, I know that many of you have some questions that I haven't gotten around to answering, but feel free to follow us online and um, you can learn more about the things we do. I, I can share the, the, the screen with you again for those of you who are interested in following us online. Um, you can follow us on these platforms on Instagram. Okay, so please feel free to check us out. And if you have any questions, you can always DM me at Smart Art Board Game. You can DM me at, at Lighthearted Parenting, and I will respond to your questions there. Um, wishing you all a lovely, lovely day further. Thank you all for your active participation. It's been a real pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye.